Anno Domini 1977, the year nerddom seemed to come into its kingdom. Star Wars hit the theaters for the first time. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons saw its first appearance. And somewhere in Hammersmith, England, White Dwarf hit the shelves for the first time. Now why am I saying all this? Because the miniatures that I am going to paint today have a legacy that is even older. Good morning everyone. So we're going to try something a little different today. Up till now you have seen me paint Citadel miniatures. Those are kind of the official miniatures of Games Workshop and thus of Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer 40,000. But they aren't the be all end all of miniatures. In fact, they aren't even the be all end all of miniatures in the history of Warhammer. There are other companies that wanted to get in on the action. And these are dating as far back as the 80s, the 90s, etc. Two of which I'm going to be addressing today Grenadier and Ralph Partha. So before I get into those things, I have to address my sponsor of a sort. So thanks, Michelle, for all the loot that you've given me that I'm painting now. You made me as happy as an orc beset by squigs. So let's start with the business. Grenadier models first. Grenadier was a company founded in 1975 as a historical miniatures company. But by the time the 80s and 90s rolled around, they moved on to fantasy models. I like to think of them as the highbrow historian who went lowbrow, because, well, Dungeons and Dragons, Warhammer, those things were popular in the 80s and early 90s, and they had to keep up. Now, they kept up with it so well for a while, they were actually the official model producers for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, of which this Shoggoth is a model. But the real powerhouse here was Ral Partha, also founded in 1975, predominantly to produce sword and sorcery stuff for a sword and sorcery audience. Now, they've done everything from Dungeons and Dragons to Shadowrun to Star Wars, everything, at least in that sort of vein of things. And above all, they predate Games Workshop and Citadel Miniatures. In fact, Citadel was created as a means of distributing their miniatures originally. So it's no wonder you see a lot of similarities to Games Workshop's later stuff here. So what I'm going to be painting is one of these orc miniatures sculpted for Grenadier by Nick Lund in 1987, and this one Ralph Partha miniature sculpted for Chaos Wars in 86. Now it's important to remember that these companies didn't just ape the Warhammer miniatures. They had miniature lines of their own for D&D, Shadowrun, for the Star Wars role-playing games, and later in the series I'm probably going to end up addressing some of those miniatures as well. But for right now, I'd say let's keep it into familiar territory and kind of ease into it. We'll start with the Grenadier Orc. My first thought was, yay, orc flesh, but on a smaller model. What could be worse? So yeah, yeah, base coat, inking the recesses, dry brushing over the top, line highlighting to get the details, and moving on to the base coat of everything else. So I'm going to do a dark brown for the tunic, blue for the pants, gray for the boots, and we'll worry about the metal later. And boy, do we have to worry about the metal. This chainmail coat he's wearing under here still has to be dry brushed like ordinary chainmail, but my ordinary dry brush is too big to get in there, so I have to sacrifice my detail brush to get these places. Yeah, I know this brush isn't walking away from this experiment, but the good news is, is that the line highlighting becomes infinitely easier with the decreased size of the model. See how my detail brush just perfectly fits the folds in these pants? Yeah, I'm actually starting to relish the task for once. Just a lighter shade of blue here and everywhere else along the fold of the pants, even under that rip in the knees where the knees show through, is easier for me to do with line highlighting. So thank you Grenadier for making a model that I actually enjoy line highlighting for once, and is actually small enough to make my line highlighting look good. Whew. That's a relief that I don't have to worry about that, because the real challenges lie still ahead. Now you see that blank shield there? I consider that a challenge. Tell me that doesn't scream, hey Derek, why don't you come over here and paint a giant Evil Suns logo on me? Just, you know, take up the entire shield with it. Well, challenge accepted. I start with a red base, 
and I kind of just line highlight raised areas of a wrinkled brow, cheekbones, chin, places where the jaw would be, you know, all that detail work. And then I can go on to painting teeth, painting eyes, painting nostrils, stuff like that. But while I do that, let me just go on a quick, awesome rant about this. Do you have any idea the degree of customization this allows for? I can see why Grenadier miniatures like this were so popular with D&D players. They allow for so much unique coloration, so much creativity, that every different Grenadier miniature like this is bound to be that person's own dudes. Like, no two of these orcs are going to look the same, no matter how hard you try, and no matter f how far you look. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody who's done a much better Evil Sun logo on their shield out there than I've done it, but, you know, still, sentiment, right? So, once I've got this face all put in there, like I've got right now, with the, uh, basically just drawing on it, I'm not content. Orcs like checker patterns, and I feel like I want to do that all the way along the outside of the shield. So, once I get these line dot highlights in here. Or, yeah, phew, for once this actually works out. God, I love this miniature. I can then start the check pattern. You know, I kind of feel like this is a slight against Grenadier. For a while there, Citadel miniatures, especially Citadel paints, was using this very symbol on their spray cans. I kind of feel like I'm pissing on the grave of a great company, but I think they'll understand the mentality. Won't they? <laughs> I hope. Alright, let's get that check pattern finally resolved. Now, I know I'm going to have to do a lot of cleanup. I know I'm going to have to go back in there. But for the most part, this is easy enough. Once I get my brush to cooperate with me, making these checks on this border of the shield, piece of cake. And it looks absolutely phenomenal. You know, this might even rival a Citadel miniature for how good this is, uh, you know, how good it's possible to look. I mean, just take a gander at this thing. I would not hesitate to play this actively in a Mordheim game these days. All in all, painting this wasn't that different than painting a Citadel miniature orc. Only difference is it was a lot smaller and possibly lacked a little bit of the detail of a Citadel miniature, but I don't think that was as much of a problem. Now, however, we're going on to something even smaller, something that's got even more detail. It's the Ralpartha Chaos Knight. The first thing I notice about it is that the armor doesn't leave me a whole lot of room to be creative. The pattern is already mapped out for me, so the most creative I can really get with this particular miniature is in its color scheme. So I know this is a fantasy piece, but I have always been moved by the chaos armor of the Word Bearers Legion in Warhammer 40,000. Something about that just speaks volumes about quiet menace. I don't know why, it's not like that's part of their lore, but that's the impression I get. And I think quiet menace is exactly what this miniature is going for. So for most of this, I'm not going to be using a dry brush, I'm not even going to be using a base coat brush anymore. I am only going to be using these detail brushes, and you can see already they're afraid to all get out. Oh god, doing these line highlights is a pain in my ass. How big were brushes in the 80s that these lines were even remotely accessible? Like, even an ordinary painter would have trouble with this. Huh. Maybe I was just not supposed to do these accents. Oh well, we'll think about that at a different time. For the sword, I want this to be kind of a burning effect. So I'm going to base coat it all in a dark brown, almost black. And then I'm going to dry brush and fade and blend up from brown to orange to red to yellow to white and edge highlight it all around with those contrasting colors to give it a burning effect. I did a similar thing on a blood letter way back in the day. So I have no intention of letting that technique fall out of my repertoire anytime soon. So the blending has been a success, but now it's time for the edge highlighting, which I will not sugarcoat it. This was lame. 
My brush is the smallest that it can get right now, and it's still too big for these details. It's not like the Grenadier model where line highlighting was ideal and fun. This is a pain. How big were brushes in the 80s? I repeat myself. Oh, I swear this miniature was cursed. I broke two brushes on it. Two brushes snapped right below the bristles painting this thing. Now I have to go and get new ones for my future models, but this one, I had to just kind of keep trucking along using just my thumb and my forefinger to paint those details. Or at least I did until I finally gave in and used a frayed brush that I had lying around. And now my problems have increased tenfold. Fuck this skin. Jesus, man, like look at these muscle details. They're almost non-existent. I have to paint them on with a frayed brush that is rapidly accumulating paint sediment. Gods, this could not get any more unideal, and I am not having a good time with it. And above all, on the hand here, each finger has to be hand highlighted. God, the amount of precision this requires. I can understand why a lot of people choose to paint Ralpartha miniatures as part of their Golden Demon competition entries. Yeah, no thanks, bro. Not me. Not my level. Not yet. And not my comfort zone, for sure. Oh well, at least for now it's looking acceptable. The blending was a success. Edge highlighting of the armor seems to be a success. And while the flesh may look a little chunky, it still looks decent enough once I can manage to highlight it just a little bit more. Yeah, like that. And then I'll have to address the horns and the haft of the sword in a bit. For that, I'm gonna have to dry brush. For that, I'm gonna have to sacrifice another detail brush or something thereabouts because I don't have a brush small enough to get in there and dry brush it. Well, here it is. Finished. As good as it's gonna get. Quiet menace indeed. Well, that was an experience and a half. Aside from breaking my brushes on that Chaos Soldier, I'd say this is a pretty fun experience. It's good to kind of break up the monotony of painting Citadel miniatures over and over again with something like this. And for real, I enjoyed the freedom that the Grenadier miniatures gave to me. And I've got maybe three or four more orcs from them to paint. So I'll do that on my own time, but boy, am I gonna relish that. As for the Ral Partha stuff, well, I've got a few more miniatures from them. I got another Chaos Mini, I've got a Demon, and I've got a Elf, I believe. And I'm gonna wait a little bit before getting to them. I'm not sure I like the Ral Partha stuff as much. But then again, it's a matter of personal taste. So next time, guys, we're gonna go back to Citadel Miniatures. And we're going to address something from a more niche game in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, or at least a niche game style that is, seems to be making a comeback these days. So I'll see you all then.